In the early 1900s, Metropolis, Nevada was touted to be a booming new settlement with all the potential to become a hub of farming and community. But the promise of greener pastures was nothing more than a scam, and those who bought land in Metropolis soon found themselves with no water for their crops and overrun by jackrabbits and giant crickets. Today, all that remains is a haunting ghost town littered with abandoned artifacts and crumbling ruins left by the people who once came here in the hopes of a better life. Metropolis, Nevada was a town never meant to be. Designed to be an agricultural wonderland in the midst of the vast deserts of Nevada, this project would never achieve more than a fraction of its potential. Climate and legal courts conspired to end this city-to-be long before it ever had a chance to flourish and prove its place in the wide, open spaces of the Great Basin. In 1900, Nevada had a population of just over 40,000 people. By 1910, this number had increased to 82,000. Clearly, the trend was towards growth and settlement, and many enterprises wanted to make their fortune in this seemingly godforsaken place. With this in mind, the Pacific Reclamation Company of New York hatched its plan around 1909, though the corporate records are at best unclear as to the exact timing. Metropolis was to be a showcase near the headwaters of the Humboldt River, a somewhat fertile area in northeast Nevada. The initial plan called for 40,000 acres of irrigated and non-irrigated farmland, ringing a city of 7,500 people. About 1909, Harry Pierce and a bunch of investors formed what was called the Pacific Reclamation Company with the idea that they would effectively come out and reclaim the desert. They felt that it was barren, that it was not being put to use, and that with the proper energy and resources, that the desert could become a vibrant living place. So they formed the Pacific Reclamation Company. They platted out this town and thought, this seems like a good place to live. By late 1909, Pacific Reclamation had opened a satellite office in Salt Lake City, Utah, and started to publicize the project. An article by the Evening Standard in Ogden, Utah, dated August 23, 1912, captured the optimism, reading, Within a comparatively short time, the town of Metropolis and the country surrounding it will mean a great deal for the Junction City and for Utah. It will be one of the most talked of grain producing sections in the West. Metropolis itself will be a unique example of the elemental energy and Western resourcefulness. Metropolis's founders intended to attract ranchers, farmers, merchants, and families from all over the West, and in particular from nearby Utah. The LDS Church, headquartered in Utah, believed the barons of the Western desert states were their new promised land and the church actively promoted settling these wild territories in the hopes of populating them with ever-growing LDS families. By 1911, Pacific Reclamation had staked out and plotted the streets, lots, and two parks. A newspaper, The Chronicle, started publication in September 1911. In its early pages, The Chronicle advertised heavily for Metropolis, with dry farmland going for $10 to $15 per acre, irrigated farmland for $75 per acre, and lots within the town proper ranging from $100 to $300. The commercial district as platted would be four blocks square, and the town would have all the modern amenities any migrant could hope for. Concrete sidewalks, fire hydrants, a sanitation system, and a rail line were just some of the things Metropolis could boast in its marketing campaign. This is how you would have run indoor electricity back in 1912. If you had a wood frame building and you needed to remove wire, run wiring through, you drill a hole in it, and you would stick this tube through that hole, and then you would run your wire through the tube. So it acted as, as a, an insulator and kind of a protector. Another interesting thing is this piece of pipe. So it would have been used for sewage. So this did not carry fresh water because it had lead in it, but it was known as a sanitary means of removing waste from the homes and from businesses back then. By the end of 1911, the vaunted Southern Pacific Railroad completed a spur line from the main line in Telosco, adding a fine rail depot complete with a small park. So by the end of 1911, 
uh, the founders of Metropolis had convinced Southern Pacific Railroad to establish a spur line, which came in right over there, about 200 yards in the direction that we're looking right now. It terminated in a station with a couple of parks, and this was all built on Southern Pacific's time. Things were only looking up for the project, and it seemed to be an unstoppable burst of American optimism taking physical form in the Wild West. As the calendar rang in 1912, the Pacific Reclamation Company barreled ahead with its plans, starting construction on a dam across Bishop Creek, a primary tributary of the Humboldt River. This dam, with its feeder canals, needed to play a critical part in the establishment and prosperity of Metropolis, and in a seeming race against time, water deliveries started in May 1912. That is the dam that was built to impound Bishop Creek, which is this right here, and store water for delivery to Metropolis. Keep in mind, this dam was no throw-together project. Pacific Reclamation constructed a concrete dam with steel reinforcement and engineered earthen fill, similar to many dams that still dot the country. With the dam completed and the impoundment filling behind it, the end of 1912 counted roughly 700 residents in Metropolis, most of them LDS. By then, the town had added a post office, a wagon factory, five saloons, and a modern brick hotel costing upwards of $75,000 in 1912 dollars, about $2.3 million in the present day. The plan also called for the establishment of at least one formal bank, backed by Utah investors though that part of the plan didn't seem to fully blossom. Instead, the hotel would double as the bank, securing funds and valuables in two large concrete vaults still visible today. One of the interesting things about hotels, especially in the early 20th century, is that not only were they a place for people to stay, they would hold valuables for both locals and for guests. The upper vault here would have been for hotel guests who wanted to, you know, they might have been staying for a few days, had some valuables. The lower vault was for the locals. So people who lived in town, maybe had family heirlooms, valuables, cash, coins, would bring them to the hotel. And if, it's kind of like going to a safe deposit box today, if, if you're familiar with that. To further accommodate families, Metropolis finished building a school in 1914, anticipating the need to serve a large population the school was no rural single-room clapboard contraption. The school, made of bricks sourced from undocumented locations, cost $25,000 in 1914 dollars, about $740,000 in the present day. School itself, they say it's made from brick, but as we've seen, it's made from brick and it's also made from poured concrete, poured reinforced concrete. Brick was expensive compared to concrete. Poured concrete was I wouldn't say revolutionary for the time, but it was a more modern way of constructing uh, buildings. Piping right there, uh, most people would say, well, that's just a pipe. But what it represents is the fact that they had running water, they had gas, they had electricity out here in 1911, 1912. As you can see, it's coming apart. We even got holes in the foundation. One thing to note is that while there is a lot of poured concrete down here in the foundation in the basement, also see a lot of this brick, this sort of hollow brick stuff here. So the majority of the school was actually made out of masonry. Pacific Reclamation Company had big plans and dreams for this corner of Northeast Nevada. Little did it know that those plans would be put to the test by both local courts and Mother Nature. Nevada, one of the driest places in the lower 48 states, became a state in 1864. Mines big and small tapped the majority of available waters, with the remainder being used for small businesses, human consumption, agriculture, and livestock. Except for a very short period between 1872 and 1885, Nevada water law has rested upon the appropriation doctrine. The appropriation doctrine is a first-in-time, first-in-right doctrine meaning whoever first puts a quantity of water to beneficial use, personal, agricultural, or industrial, obtains a continuing right to that quantity of water in the future. Users later in time may take the remainder for their uses, so long as that use does not infringe on the rights of the earlier-in-time users. 
Pacific Reclamation Company, a later user of Humboldt River waters, directly infringed on the rights of users downstream in Lovelock and the surrounding lands. These ranchers and farmers, long accustomed to their rightful take of water, wasted no time in bringing a lawsuit in state court. Nevada would surprisingly reform its water laws in 1913, but even those new laws would not likely have saved Metropolis from an early grave. When the Bishop Creek Dam was completed in mid-1912, ranchers and farmers downstream in Lovelock, Nevada immediately brought suit in state court. With the water question now before the judiciary, the entire notion of reclaiming tens of thousands of acres of desert to turn them into irrigated farmland hung on the decision of a single case. The lawsuit, widely publicized, drew the attention of Nevada and Utah newspapers alike, and once the word got out, people began to rapidly lose interest in Metropolis. Unlike water law cases today, the case against Pacific Reclamation Company appeared to be a fairly simple issue for the court to decide, yet it was not. The company lost access to much of the impounded water and could only take a fraction of what Metropolis truly needed. By any reckoning, the leftover supply of water would not be enough to let Metropolis survive at its then current size, let alone the more grand version its founders had hoped for. As expected in early 1913, Pacific Reclamation Company lost its court fight, sort of. The shape of the final settlement is described as, a reasonable basis of compromise was reached by which the matter could be settled out of court upon payment by the Reclamation Company of legal expenses claimed to have been incurred by the Lovelock ranchers. The attorneys for the Lovelock ranchers unfortunately could not outwork any satisfactory details of this plan. There were apparently disputes among the Lovelock ranchers and their attorneys as to the ultimate amount of money damages sought. Unfortunately, this was a moot point, because even if a dollar amount could reasonably be determined, the loss of water was a blow Metropolis could not ultimately survive. On paper, the Lovelock ranchers technically lost the lawsuit, as they had asked the court to prevent Pacific Reclamation Company from impounding any waters upstream of Lovelock. What the ranchers got was a ruling that allowed Pacific Reclamation to impound water sufficient to irrigate only 4,000 acres of land. This, in the eyes of counsel, was technically a win for Metropolis, at least on paper. As it would turn out, Pacific Reclamation Company, despite its name, was unable to properly apportion even this small amount of water among the existing farms. Some would flood, and some at the distant ends of canals and laterals would receive a mere trickle of water. There remained a glimmer of hope based on the concept of dry farming, which relies on natural moisture in local soils to supply the needs of various crops. While the area did see some initial success with dry farming in 1912 and 1913, several previous winters had been unseasonably wet, charging the local soils with more moisture than they would normally have. The promotional materials for Metropolis intentionally, but wrongly, boasted an annual rainfall of 13 inches. The few exceptionally wet winters certainly gave the appearance that the area would reap the benefits of abundant precipitation, but the area typically sees between 8 and 9 inches of precipitation, including the occasional summer thunderstorm. At its core, the whole premise of Metropolis stood on unsustainable and unrealistic climate expectations. Because of the unusually wet winters, the first rounds of dry farming met with resounding success, but the yields in 1914 and afterwards were abysmal. What little irrigation water remained after the lawsuit did not suffice to supply all the local farms, and some farmers and their families began to drift elsewhere for literal greener pastures. Other forces of nature conspired against the farming community as well. Under the belief that rains would replenish the soils on a regular basis, farmers didn't employ good soil conservation practices. With the onset of dry years, topsoil began to blow away and entire farms were lost to the wind. One of the problems that Pacific Reclamation ran into was their mistaken forecasts about the soil conditions out here and how much um, moisture would reside in the ground to support dry farming. They lost the impounded water at Bishop Creek 
which is right back there at that low spot in the mountains. They did not have enough rainfall and snowfall to support dry farming, and they couldn't sell lots, they couldn't attract businesses. Native animals would have their hand in decimating local farmers as well. Long viewed as a menace to men and domestic animals, local coyote populations were hunted to near extinction. This created an imbalance in the traditional predator-prey relationship, and the local jackrabbit population exploded in the coming years. An agricultural pest, the local farmers and ranchers would drive or herd rabbits into pens where they were slaughtered in vast numbers as a means of pest control. With no coyotes and no jackrabbits to pilfer local crops, local ground squirrels became the next plague on the fields. These voracious animals proved harder to control and would ultimately do their part to eat the farmers out of house and home. By spring of 1913, Pacific Reclamation Company had declared bankruptcy and found itself in receivership. The Weekly Independent of Elko also noted in its April 4, 1913 edition that the subsidiary company of Pacific, the Metropolis Improvement Company, entered receivership on the same day under the care of a Mr. George M. Bacon. Mr. Bacon, appointed by the Nevada Federal Court in Carson City, was instructed to operate Pacific Reclamation Company and Metropolis Improvement Company as going concerns. This means Mr. Bacon was to do his best to keep both companies operating within the means of the assets they then possessed. So, who was George Bacon? Bacon served as the consulting engineer for Pacific Reclamation Company from its inception and became general manager in November 1912, as the courts were starting to sort out the water rights issue. In response to the downfall of the organization, Mr. Bacon is quoted as saying, There is no one connected with either company who does not view with extreme regret the stern necessity which compelled this step. The companies have not been subject to any misfortune peculiar themselves, except the action brought by the Lovelock ranchers affecting a part of the water rights. Despite Bacon's ill feelings about the lawsuit and its outcome, and perhaps in spite of the now shrinking population of Metropolis, the decrease in population did have one beneficial effect. With fewer acres needing irrigation, those hardy souls who remained were able to use the leftover water to successfully irrigate fields and raise healthy crops of wheat and potatoes. Some ranchers in Metropolis even found success in the dairy industry, managing to ship cream to markets as far away as Reno during the early 1920s. Starting around 1924, activity in the town and on the local farms started to wane. A year later, the Southern Pacific Railroad closed its spur line to Metropolis, effectively cutting the town off from cheap shipping of goods to distant markets fields began to lay fallow and the desert slowly reclaimed them with sand, salt, and sagebrush. Some enterprising individuals not only moved their personal possessions, but took their buildings with them to other booming towns throughout the state. The Metropolis Hotel burned down in 1936, and the post office ceased operation in 1942. By 1947, even the school, with no students left to educate, closed. People were failing on their farms, they were failing on their ranches, they decided to leave the area, there was no water. Businesses either didn't come or closed down. The hotel had no guests, it had no business to conduct, it shut down and called it a day. Today, no one lives in Metropolis. The last diehard holdouts left in the late 1940s and early 1950s. A few ranches still operate near the old town site but Metropolis itself is rapidly succumbing to the relentless forces of the Great Basin, slowly being swallowed up by time and the elements. Well, we found the car graveyard, or what's left of it. This is like a 50s, maybe a 40s vehicle, so it could have been left here by one of the last residents. Um, some interesting artifacts here. Uh, these would have been the covers to old coal and wood-burning stoves. Uh, looks like an old barrel hoop, spoked wheel off of a tricycle or something. Only ghosts walk the crumbling sidewalks, and the only cries one hears are those of the wind howling down the surrounding canyons. You can visit what remains of Metropolis, though the ruins are unsafe and in extremely poor condition. If you do take a trip out that way, 
bring plenty of water, the same substance precious to all life that doomed a great dream in the Great Basin.